This chapter discusses data integration, data quality, and data governance. It is based upon our book, Principles of Database Management, published by Cambridge University Press. You can find more information about our book on the website at the bottom of my slide. My name is Bart Balsens, and I'm one of the authors of the book. In this chapter, we will look at some managerial and technical aspects of data integration. We will zoom in on data and process integration techniques. We will discuss different patterns for data integration. We will also focus on techniques to efficiently search unstructured data, both within an intra-enterprise data integration setting and across the World Wide Web. Data integration is also heavily related to data quality, so we will discuss this managerial concern and master data management. Finally, we look at data governance standards that help companies to set up initiatives to measure, monitor, and improve data integration and quality practices. To conclude our discussion on data integration, quality, and governance, we provide an outlook on some more recent approaches to tackle these issues. In what follows, we elaborate on data and process integration. We start by highlighting the convergence of analytical and operational data needs. We then zoom in on data integration and data integration patterns. We conclude by discussing data services and data flows in the context of data and process integration. Data integration aims at providing a unified view and or unified access over heterogeneous and possibly distributed data sources. In what follows, we discuss different approaches and patterns to realize this, with a different trade-off between concerns such as data quality, performance, the ability to transform the data, etc. In addition, we introduce the concept of process integration. Process integration deals with the sequencing of, sequencing of tasks in a business process, but also governs the data flows in these processes. In this way, the data flows in process integration are complementary to data integration, because they aim at making the right data available to applications and human actors to perform their tasks with the appropriate input data. Therefore, ideally, both data and processes are considered in a data integration effort. We start, however, with the rationale behind the data integration needs in a contemporary data processing context. Traditionally, applications and databases were organized around domains such as accounting, human resources, logistics, CRM, etc. Every department or business unit worked with its own data silo, for example, a file or database with no cross-department integration. Operational processes used these data silos, data silos to answer simple queries or perform updates in near real time on the detailed underlying data. Whereas the silos mainly aimed at operational support, the next phase saw the emergence of business intelligence, BI, and analytics applications, fueled by the need for data-driven tactical and strategical decision-making with a company-wide impact. To sustain this company-wide view, data from the silos was transformed, integrated, and consolidated into a company-wide data warehouse. Because of this evolution, we were confronted for nearly two deca decades with a dual data storage and processing landscape, supported by two very distinct scenes of tool vendors and products. On the one hand, operational applications performed simple queries on operational data silos, containing an up-to-date snapshot of the business state in the domain at hand. Business intelligence and analytics applications supported tactical and strategic decision-making 
by analyzing company-wide data in a data warehouse. The data warehouse contained not only detailed operational data, but also historical, enriched and aggregated data. However, the ETL process of extracting data from the source systems, transforming it into the appropriate format for analysis and loading it into the data warehouse was time consuming. Therefore, there was a certain latency between the up-to-date operational data stores and the slightly outdated data warehouse. This latency was tolerable. Real-time business intelligence was not the goal in traditional data warehousing. The goal was to support business executives in their decision-making at ad hoc moments in time, for example, daily or monthly. Nowadays, we see a complete convergence of the operational and tactical or strategic data needs of the corresponding data integration tooling. This trend was initiated by new marketing practices centered on proactive, instead of reactive, actions requiring a complete understanding of the customer and quickly spread towards other functional domains. It culminates in the term operational BI with a twofold meaning. On the one hand, analytics techniques are more and more used at the operational level as well by frontline employees. Analytics for tactic or strategic decision making increasingly, increasingly uses real-time operational data combined with the aggregated and historical data found in more traditional data warehouses. In both cases, this operational usage of business intelligence aims for a low or even zero latency, so unexpected business-altering events or trends in the data can be immediately detected and accompanied with the appropriate response. The idea is to move more and more from batch processing to near real-time business intelligence where historical data is combined with and often compared to real-time trends and insights and analyzed 24-7. To provide some examples, think of executive dashboards that monitor KPIs in real-time. Another example is business process monitoring and business activity monitoring for the timely detection of anomalies or opportunities in business processes. Companies such as Netflix and Amazon detect cross-selling opportunities in real time by a recommender system, and credit card processors detect credit card fraud soon after the transaction is initiated. This evolution poses interesting challenges to the landscape of data storage and data integration solutions. This is especially true in big data analytics, where new insights are acquired by combining and enriching more traditional data types with new kinds of internal and external data, often with a very volatile structure and very extensive in size. Different data are drawn into the analysis, such as clickstream data, server logs, sensor data, social media feeds, etc. However, an equally big challenge is the integration of these diverse data types in such a way they can be processed and analyzed efficiently, often with pressing constraints regarding the real-time character of the data or even the need to open so-called streaming data for analysis on the fly. Here is the outline of our next section. We first further zoom in on data integration. We then discuss data consolidation, data federation, data propagation, change data capture, CDC, near, near real-time ETL, event processing, data virtualization, data as a service, and data in the cloud. Data integration aims at providing a unified and consistent view of all enterprise-wide data. The data itself may be heterogeneous and reside in different resources. The desired extent of data integration will highly depend upon the required quality of service characteristics. Data will never be of perfect quality, so a certain level of inaccurate, incomplete 
or inconsistent data may have to be tolerated for operational BI to succeed. Different data integration patterns exist to provide this unified view. First, we discuss the following basic data integration patterns, data consolidation, data federation, and data propagation. Then, we deal with more advanced techniques and the interplay between data integration and process integration. Note that the integration can be both logical or physical. The essence of data consolidation as a data integration pattern is to capture the data from multiple heterogeneous source systems and integrate it into a single persistent store such as a data warehouse or data mart. This is typically accomplished using extract, transform and load ETL routines. ETL is a technology supporting the following activities. Extract data from heterogeneous data sources, including legacy and external sources. Transform the data to satisfy business needs. Load the transformed data into a target system, for example, a data warehouse. Because of the transformations, this pattern has a positive impact on many data quality dimensions, such as completeness, consistency, and interpretability. Another important advantage of the consolidation approach is that it caters for not only present information, but also historical data. Since the changed business state does not result in updates to the data, but in additions of new data. On the downside, the ETL process typically induces a certain measure of latency, so the timeliness dimension may suffer with the data being slightly out of date. Consolidation also requires a physical target, so additional storage capacity is consumed. There exist different variations on the ETL process. For example, either a full update or an incremental refreshment strategy of the target data store can be adopted. Note that some vendors propose another variant, ELT, Extract Load Transform, with the transformation being performed directly in the physical target system. Data lakes can also be an implementation of the consolidation pattern. However, in contrast to a data warehouse, the data is mostly consolidated in the native format it had in the source systems with little transformation or cleansing. Therefore, the positive impact on the respective data quality dimensions will be limited compared to a data warehouse, but this is often less of an issue for the big data types typically stored in data lakes where the formal structure is much more volatile or even completely absent. Analyzing the data may still require some pre-processing and restructuring, which would already have been performed upfront with a data warehouse. Instead of capturing and integrating the data in one consolidated store, Data Federation typically follows a pull approach, where data is pulled from the underlying source systems on an on-demand basis. Enterprise Information Integration EII, is an example of a Data Federation technology. EII can be implemented by realizing a virtual business view on the dispersed underlying data sources. The view serves as a universal data access layer. The data sources internals are isolated from the outside world with wrappers. In this way, the virtual view shields the applications and processes from the complexities of retrieving the data, the needed data from multiple locations with different semantics, formats and interfaces. No moving or replication of data is needed since all data stays in the source systems. Hence, a federation strategy enables real-time access to current data, which was not the case for a data consolidation strategy. Only limited transformation and cleansing capabilities are possible. Many EII technologies are read-only, 
but some also support update operations on the business view, which are then applied to the underlying data stores. EII is less suitable for complex queries, including, for example, joins between structured and unstructured data. Therefore, EII, EII is often adopted by firms as a temporary measure following a merger or acquisition. Here you can see an illustration of enterprise information integration as a data federation solution. One important disadvantage of EII is overall worse performance. Since queries performed on the business view must be translated to underlying data sources, a performance hit is unavoidable. Another related issue is whether the store systems will continue to receive direct queries, or in other words, queries that do not go through the federation layer. There, you must remember that the existing operational source systems may incur an increased utilization rate, as they now must handle both direct incoming queries and those coming from the federation layer, leading to a potential performance hit. Finally, note that EII solutions are limited in the number of transformation and cleansing they can perform on query result sets. In case data from multiple sources has to be transformed, aggregated or cleansed before it can be ready for use, a data consolidation approach might be a better solution. The data propagation pattern corresponds to the synchronous or asynchronous propagation of updates or more generally, events in a source system to a target system. The data propagation pattern can be applied at two levels in a system architecture. It can be applied in the interaction between two applications or in the synchronization between two data stores. In an application interaction context, we speak of Enterprise Application Integration, EAI. In a data store context, we speak of Enterprise Data Replication, EDR. The idea of Enterprise Application Integration, EAI, is that an event in a source application requires some processing within the target application. For example, if an order is received in an order handling application, this may trigger the creation of an invoice in the invoicing application. There exist many distinct EAI technologies to realize this triggering, ranging from web services, .NET or Java interfaces, messaging middleware, event notification buses, remote procedure call technology, legacy application interfaces and adapters, etc. However, Besides the triggering of some processing within the target application, such exchange nearly always involves small amounts of data being propagated from the source to the target application as well. You can see the workings of enterprise application integration illustrated here. The data propagation in EAI may occur synchronously, so the message is sent along with the data at the moment the event occurs in the source system. The target system may respond immediately, but the message may also be queued before being processed, resulting in asynchronous interaction. The advantage of an asynchronous approach is less interdependence between the respective systems, but the downside is a certain latency in responding to an event and processing the data that goes along with it. Enterprise Data Replication, EDR, implies the events in the source system explicitly pertain to update events in the data store. Replication means copying the updates in the source system in near real time to a target data store which serves as an exact replica. At the software level, this can be implemented by the operating system, DBMS or a separate replication server. As an alternative, a separate hardware storage controller can be used. EDR has been traditionally adopted for load balancing, 
ensuring high availability, recovery, but not data integration as such. However, recently it is being used more often for BI and to offload data from the source systems into a separate data store, which is an exact replica. Here you can see Enterprise Data Replication Illustrated. A technology complementary to ETL, which adds the event paradigm to ETL, is Changed Data Capture, CDC. CDC technology can detect update events in the source data store and trigger the ETL process based on these updates. In this way, a push model to ETL is supported. The ETL process is triggered by any significant change in the underlying data store or data stores. This is in contrast with traditional ETL, where data extraction occurs on scheduled time intervals or in periods with low system workload, but without considering actual changes in the source data. This approach is often technically more complex as its visibility depends to a certain extent on the characteristics and openness of the source systems. The event notification pattern can also play other roles in a data processing setting. Complex event processing CEP, refers to a series of analytics techniques that do not focus on individual, on individual events, but rather on the interrelationships between events and patterns within, within so-called event clouds. For example, a suddenly changing pattern in purchases made with a certain credit card may be an indication of fraud. Event notifications can be buffered and in this way acted upon asynchronously or they can be processed in real time. The latter can be supported by technologies that can cope with so-called streaming data. Data virtualization is a more recent approach to data integration that also aims to offer a unified data view for applications to retrieve and manipulate data without necessarily knowing where the data is stored physically or how it is structured and formatted at the sources. Data virtualization builds upon the basic data integration patterns discussed previously, but also isolates applications and users from the actual integration patterns used. ETL is avoided since the source data remains in place and real-time access is provided to the source systems of the data. This approach hence seems familiar to data federation, but an important difference of data virtualization is that contrary to a federated database, virtualization does not impose a single data model on top of the heterogeneous data sources. Virtual views on the data can be defined at will and can be mapped top-down into relational and non-relational data sources. Data virtualization systems can apply various transformations before offering the data to its consumers. Hence, they combine the best features of traditional data consolidation, such as the ability to provide data transformations and the ability to provide data in real time. To guarantee sufficient performance, Virtual views are cached transparently and query optimization and parallelization techniques are applied. For very large volumes of data, the combination of consolidation and ETL may be the most efficient approach performance-wise. Here, virtualization techniques can provide a unified view of the consolidated data and other data sources. For example, to integrate historical data with real-time data. Hence, in many real-life contexts, a data integration exercise is an ongoing initiative within an organization and will often combine many integration strategies and approaches. This is illustrated in this figure. The pattern of virtualization is often linked to the concept of data as a service, in which data services are offered as part of the overall service-oriented architecture where business processes are supported by a set of loosely coupled software services. 
Many commercial data integration suites adhere to the, to the SOA principles and support the creation of data services. Data services can be read-only or updatable. Most in data integration suites also provide easy features for data service composition, in which data from different services can be combined and aggregated into a new composite service. Because the consumer is isolated from technical details, data services cater for a degree of self-service BI, in which data services can be composed and then subjected to data analytics algorithms simply by a business user dragging and dropping icons representing data services in a graphical user interface. Data as a service is in its turn often related to cloud computing. The as a service and in the cloud concepts are very related, with the former putting more emphasis on the consumer perspective and the latter mainly emphasizing the provisioning and infrastructure aspect. The properties of cloud computing are hardware, software, and or infrastructure are provided on demand over a network. Clouds can be public, private, or hybrid. An attractive property of public and hybrid clouds are the fading boundaries between one's own infrastructure and the service provider's infrastructure. The ability to convert fixed infrastructure costs and upfront investments into variable costs. A downside is the risk of vendor lock-in and or unexpected switching costs. Another possible risk exists regarding performance guarantees, privacy and security, which can be partially mitigated by scrupulously asserting formal service level agreements, SLAs. The question of accountability of the cloud service provider if a calamity occurs or damage. Different data related services can be hosted in the cloud. Software as a service. Full applications are hosted in the cloud, for example, applications for analytics, data cleansing, or data quality reporting. Platform as a service. Computing platform elements are, housed in the are hosted in the cloud, which can run and integrate with one's own applications. For example, a cloud storage platform offering simple key value store functionality, such as Amazon S3. Infrastructure as a service. Hardware infrastructure, such as server storage, are offered as virtual machines in the cloud. For example, cloud-hosted storage hardware. Data as a service. Data services are hosted in the cloud, typically based on strict SLAs and sometimes with additional features such as data quality monitoring or cloud-based data integration tools to integrate one's own data with data from external providers. This chart displays the projected growth in the as-a-service sector based on a Gartner study. Both platform as a service and software as a service are projected to double in size, whereas infrastructure as a service is about to triple. These numbers demonstrate impressive growth during a three year time period. In what follows, we discuss data services and data flows in the context of data and process integration. We first elaborate on business process integration. We then zoom in on patterns for managing sequence dependencies and data dependencies in processes. We conclude by providing a unified view on data and process integration. Process integration is to integrate and harmonize the business processes in an organization as much as possible. A business process is defined as a set of tasks or activities with a certain ordering that must be executed to reach a certain organizational goal. As an example, think of a loan approval process with various tasks such as filing a loan application, calculating the credit score, drafting the loan offer, signing the contract, etc. Obviously, this also includes a data flow specifying the part of the data between these tasks. 
Business processes can be considered from two perspectives. The control flow perspective, on the one hand, specifies the correct sequencing of tasks. For example, a loan offer can only be made when the credit score has been calculated. The data flow perspective, on the other hand, focuses on the inputs of the tasks. For example, the interest rate calculation depends on the credit score. The modeling of business processes is often performed using visual flowchart languages such as Business Process Model Annotation BPMN, yet another workflow language WA, um, YAWL, Unified Modeling Language UML, Activity Diagrams, Event Driven Process Chain EPC Diagrams and so on. This figure shows our loan approval process modeled using BPMN. The execution of a process is handled by a so-called process engine, which will oversee that the steps in the process are performed correctly. To do so, the process model is often translated into a declarative definition of an executable process that can be understood and used by the process engine. One example of such an execution language is the Business Process Execution Language Standard, WS Beeple. WS Beeple can handle the data flow perspective, making sure, for instance, that the next step in a process can only be started once all details have been filled out correctly in the current step. Note that in this way, the responsibility of the task coordination, as performed by the process engine, is separated from the task execution as performed by other software components and our human actors. Business processes can become complex and several steps in a business process will often spawn sub-processes across departments. Integrating these business processes is hence an essential task for an organization where many of these processes depend on each other and where many processes may span multiple organizational units such as departments or even external partners. In modern business process setups, different business processes, tasks or sub-processes will hence be offered as services with which other parties can then invoke or utilize to achieve a certain goal, reach an outcome or receive a result. A popular way of exposing such services both within and across organizations is web services technology. Two types of dependencies should be appropriately managed to guarantee the successful overall process execution. First, a sequence dependency states that the execution of a service B depends on completing the execution of another service A, hence guaranteeing that all services are consumed in the right order. An example could be a loan proposal that can only be made after a positive credit score has been calculated. A data dependency, on the other hand, specifies that the execution of a service B depends on data provided by a service A. An example could be the interest rate of a loan proposal that depends upon the credit score calculated during the credit check. Many process engine vendors and the WS Beeple language favor the orchestration pattern. Process orchestration assumes a single centralized executable business process, the orchestrator, that coordinates the interaction among different services and sub-processes. The control flow and data flow is described at a single central place, and the orchestrator is responsible for invoking and combining the services. Here you can see the orchestration pattern illustrated. Compare this, compare this with a team of people with a central manager telling everyone exactly what and when something should be done. The team members do not care about the overall goal of the process, as the manager combines the outputs into a single deliverable.
Another pattern to manage sequence and data dependencies is choreography, which differs from orchestration because it relies on the participants themselves to coordinate their collaboration. It is hence a decentralized approach where the decision logic and interactions are distributed with no centralized point. You can see this illustrated here. Compare this again with a team of people, but now without a central manager. All the team members must know the overall process, the goal to be reached. So everyone knows when to do something and to whom to pass the work. In many real-life settings, a combination of orchestration and choreography will be applied. However, the choice of a process integration pattern is primarily made based, based on considerations regarding optimally managing the sequence dependencies, for example, according to which pattern service execution should be triggered. Data flow then just follows the same pattern as the control flow. It is important to stress that the decisions regarding managing sequence dependencies and data dependencies can be made to a certain extent independently. Part of the data dependencies may be satisfied using data flow at the process level, and part may be satisfied by data integration technology. Data flow patterns at the process layer and data integration patterns at the data layer are complementary in satisfying a service's data needs. Therefore, data integration and the data aspects of process integration should be considered in a single effort. They both contribute to managing data dependencies and the respective pattern choices made at the level of the process layer and the data layer will together determine the data lineage and quality. Data dependency between a service A and a service B can be resolved in two ways. Either the process provides a data flow between A and B, making sure that the necessary data is passed from service A to service B at the level of the business process. The other option is for service A to persist these data into a data store, which is also accessible through one of the aforementioned data integration techniques to service B to retrieve and use the data afterward. In this way, Managing data dependencies is a shared responsibility of the process layer, where the control flow and data flow are handled, and the data layer, where data integration and data storage cap capabilities reside. To analyze data flow at the process level and data integration at data layer level in a unified way, we discriminate between three types of services, workflow services, activity services, and data services. In actual service-oriented architectures, these services will correspond to real, separate software artifacts. They can, however, also be used as an instrument for analysis. Workflow services coordinate the control flow and data flow of a business process by triggering its respective, ta its respective tasks in line with the sequence constraints in the process model and according to an orchestration or choreography pattern. For example, workflow services will trigger the different tasks in a loan approval process. Some of these tasks will be human interfacing um, activities, such as a business expert assessing the risk of a complex loan request. There, the workflow service assigns the task to the appropriate human actor. For fully automated tasks, for example, an algorithm that assesses the credit risk, the workflow service triggers an activity service to perform the task. This triggering occurs through, for example, a message being sent or a method being invoked. Certain variables or parameters are passed as input along with this triggering message or method, for example, containing the idea of the customer, the amount of the requested loan, etc. This passing of variables constitutes the data flow in a business process.
Activity services perform one task in, in a business process. They are triggered by a workflow service when the corresponding task is due in the process. They can also be triggered by different workflow services. The activity service is triggered, representing the control flow, and may receive input variables, representing the data flow. The activity service may just return a result to the workflow service, but it may also alter the business state, for example, for an activity service that brings a loan into an approved state. This manipulation of business state occurs through interaction with the data services that provide access to the actual business data. Also, activity services may interact with the data services to retrieve business state not provided in their input variables. Data services provide access to the business data. Their only logic consists of so-called CRUDS functionality, create, read, update, delete, and search on data stored in the underlying data stores. Some data services will be read only, whereas others are used by activity services to alter the business state. Data services provide unified access to the underlying data stores and are realized using the data integration patterns discussed previously. The actual patterns chosen for a certain data service depend on the quality of service characteristics required for that data regarding, regarding latency, response time, completeness, consistency, etc. This figure illustrates workflow, activity, and data services in action. Different data services can be realized according to different data integration patterns. Data services based on federation provide real-time, comprehensive data about the business state, hiding the complexity of the disparate data sources from workflow and activity services. If extensive transformation, aggregation and or cleansing capabilities are needed, or performance is an issue, it is better to implement the data services using consolidation. This pattern is also required if the data service should provide access to historical data. If only performance is a criterion without the need for transformation or cleansing of historical or historical data, replication can be used to, for example, offload analytical workload from source systems and provide access to zero latency operational data for analysis. These basic patterns can be combined with approaches such as CDC and virtualization. In this way, a hybrid data integration landscape emanates. This is also facilitated by the contemporary data integration suites from the main vendors, which support different data integration patterns and the possibility to publish data services formally. Data services perspective and the process perspective should be combined to provide activity services with the necessary input data. The balance between input through data flow and through data layer can differ from context to context. Sometimes all necessary input data will be provided as part of the triggering of the activity service on top of what is mi minimally required. For example, all customer data can be provided within the triggering message even if it is available in the data layer, so the activity service needn't contact any data services. We then speak of comfort data. There is always a trade-off though. The more comfort data, the less the activity service depends on access to the data layer for its functioning. If such data, for example the customer address, was recently altered in the data layer by another process, the activity service may not be aware of this if the data is received as comfort data and will therefore work with outdated data.
The earlier, the earlier discussion is closely related to the concept of data lineage. Data lineage refers to the whole trajectory followed by a data item, from its origin, data entry, possibly over respective transformations and aggregations, until it is ultimately being used or processed. Often, the same data will be copied and distributed to multiple business processes, users and or data stores, so what was originally entered as a single data item may result in many trajectories and paths down the line, making the lineage even more difficult to trace. And yet, if the data lineage is unknown or unclear, it is very difficult to assess the data's quality, since the quality is affected by all transformations and manipulations a data item underwent throughout its journey. In this respect, it is important to take data integration patterns at data layer level and data flow at business process level into account to see the whole picture regarding data lineage and to assess the impact of the data's lineage on different data quality dimensions. A rule of thumb is that event data, such as when was an order created, what is the order quality, by whom was the stock replenished, can be safely passed as data flow as these data will never change after the actual event they describe. Other data, which refer to very business state, for example, what is the customer's current address, what is the current stock, what is the client's current credit score, should be treated with more care. It is safer that these data are retrieved through the data lay layer when needed unless the data is very stable or the impact of some of the data being somewhat outdated is limited. Hence, ideally, different subsets of the input data for an activity service to perform its task may be provided through a combination of patterns at process layer and data layer level, as illustrated in this figure. Most SOA-enabled data integration suites provide different data-related infrastructure services that support the exploitation and management of data services. Examples are the following. Data profiling services, aimed at providing automated support for assessing and understanding content, quality and structure of enterprise data, relating data from various sources to one another based on the patterns and values in the data, for example, by automatically detecting and matching foreign keys. Data cleansing services aimed at ensuring the validity and consistency of data using name and address cleansing, resolving missing fields, poor formatting and conflicting data, and standardization of various industry formats. Data enrichment services aimed at enhancing the data by exploiting external data sources. Data transformation services aimed at transform transforming data to match the target application's requirements or reconciling between data items residing in different data sources. Data event services aimed at monitoring data for state changes and rules, raising events that can be acted upon by other services. Data auditing services aimed at reporting on data lineage and when, how, by whom data was changed. This is important in auditing, reporting, and meeting the demands of internal or external auditors and legislated regulations such as Sarbanes-Oxley, Basel III, etc. Metadata services aim at supporting the storage, integration and exploitation of diverse, diverse types of metadata. The data integration patterns discussed previously are in principle applicable to both structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. However, with unstructured data, even if data integration technology yields unified access to collections of full text documents or multimedia data, there remains the question of how to search these documents efficiently. The following sections deal with the main principles of searching unstructured data and full text search in particular. We also zoom in to the specifics of searching collections of full text documents in the World Wide Web with search engines. 
We conclude with a discussion of enterprise search, which applies the same techniques to organize and search structured collections of both which, let me do that again. We conclude with a discussion of enterprise search, which applies the same techniques to organize and search distributed collections of both structured and unstructured content within an enterprise or organization. Structured data can be described according to a formal logical data model. Individual characteristics of data items can be identified and formally specified, such as the number, name, address, and email of a student, or the number and name of a course. The advantage in searching this kind of data is that a query mechanism has fine-grained control over the data. It can, for example, discriminate between a series of characters representing a student's name and a student's address. With unstructured data, there are no finer grain components in a text document that can be interpreted in a meaningful way by the search mechanism. The main idea of full text search is that individual text documents can be selected from a collection of documents according to the presence of a single search term or a combination of search terms in a document. This is also the basic principle behind web search engines like Google Search or Bing. An additional criterion can be proximity, or the fact that some search terms occur closely together, or the absence of some terms. Often, the set of documents resulting from a full text search is ordered according to relevance. A simple way of expressing the latter is the frequency with which the search term or search terms occur in the document, meaning that a document containing a term multiple times will be more relevant to the search than a document containing the term only once. Typically, this frequency is, exp is expressed in relative terms, in other words, relative to the frequency of occurrence of the term in the entire document collection. The prevalent approach for indexing full text documents is an inverted index, which is conceived as follows. The document collection is parsed up front with only relevant terms being withheld, such as preposition, in other words, prepositions, articles, conjunctions, etc. are typically omitted. An index entry is created for every individual search term. The index entries consist of search term list pointer pairs with the list pointer referring to a list of document pointers. Each document pointer refers to a document that contains the corresponding search term. For a search term TI, the list is typically of this format, DI1, WI1, up to DIN, WIN. A list item, DIJ, WIJ, contains a document pointer, DIJ, referring to a document J that contains the search, uh, t the search term TI, with J equaling, with J ranging from one to N. The list item also contains a weight, WIJ, denoting how important term TI is to document J. The weight can be calculated in different ways, but often depends on the number of occurrences of TI in document J. In addition, most search engines contain a lexicon, which maintains some statistics per search term, such as the total number of documents that contain the term. These statistics can also be used by the ranking algorithm besides the weights. A full text search then comes down to providing one or more search terms. At that time, only the index is searched, not the document collection. For each search term, the corresponding index entry yields access to a list with pointers to documents that contain the search term. You can see this illustrated here. Many search engines extend this basic approach with additional features such as a thesaurus, allowing to include documents containing synonyms or derived terms of the search terms in the search result. Proximity, allowing to enforce that only documents are withheld where particular search terms occur closely together. 
The use of fuzzy logic or similarity measures to also take into account terms very similar to the search terms, amongst other, to accommodate for misspellings. The use of text mining techniques, these are advanced analytics techniques specifically, focus, specifically focusing on unstructured textual data, for example to automatically derive the most representative key terms from a document or to classify documents according to similarity. In many cases, document metadata can also be included in the search criterion. Document metadata pertains to the properties of the document itself, such as file name, creator of the file, creation and last modification, date of the file, file type, etc. The first important component of web search is the web crawler or web spider, which continuously retrieves web pages, extracts their links or URLs to other pages, and adds these URLs to a buffer that contains the links to pages yet to be visited. Each retrieved page is sent to an indexer, which extracts all relevant terms from the page and updates the inverted index structure we discussed previously. Each relevant term corresponds to an index entry, referring to a list, list with um, DIJ, WIJ pairs, with DIJ representing the web page's URL and WIJ denoting the weight of the corresponding search term to the page. If a user issues a web search with one or more search terms, the query engine searches the index according to the search terms and sends the matching pages with their weights to a ranking module that source the result set according to relevance. Finally, this ranked result, containing essentially a list of URLs, is returned to the user. You can see this illustrated here. Enterprise search refers to the practice of making content stemming from various distributed data sources in an organization searchable. Enterprise search technologies are strongly related to standard web search products and providers with aim to offer tools that can be deployed and used internally within an organization's boundaries and not exposed to the outside world. The open source technology that, that provided a lot of groundbreaking fundamental work for subsequent tools in full text search was Apache Lucene. Originally written in 1999 in Java, it supported information retrieval from textual sources by offering indexing and searching capabilities. Elasticsearch is built on top of Lutein, Lucene and adds additional APIs, distributed search support grouping and aggregation inquiries, and allows to store documents in a scheme-free JSON format, which makes that Elasticsearch can also be described as a NoSQL database. Elasticsearch is frequently combined with two other applications that work with it, Logstash and Kibana, together forming the Elk stack. Logstash is a tool to collect and process data to store it into a backend. It is hence typically used in the ETL process of a data analysis exercise. Kibana is a web-based analytics, visualization, and search interface for Elasticsearch. Kibana supports a large number of visualization types. The Elk stack forms a powerful data analysis framework that is open source. Data integration is also heavily related to data quality. Data quality can be defined as fitness for use, meaning that the required level of quality of data depends on the context. Data quality is a multidimensional concept involving various aspects or criteria by which to access the quality of a data set or individual data record. Some example data quality dimensions are data accuracy, referring to whether the data values stored are correct, data completeness, referring to whether both metadata and values are represented to the degree required and are not missing, data consistency, relating to consistency between redundant or duplicate values, 
and consistency among different data elements referring to the same or related concept. Data accessibility, which reflects the ease of retrieving the data. And data timeliness, the extent to which data is sufficiently up to date for the task at hand. It is important to mention that data integration can both aid in improving data quality, but might also hamper it. We have seen how data consolidation and ETL allow performing different transformation and cleansing operations, so the consolidated view of the data should be of higher quality, but one might, appropriately so, wonder why it wouldn't be better to invest in data quality improvements at the source. The same remark holds for environments where throughout time different integration approaches have been combined, leading to a jungle of legacy, newer systems and databases that now all must be maintained and integrated with one another. Master Data Management MDM, comprises of a series of processes, policies, standards and tools to help organizations to define and provide a single point of reference for all data that is mastered. Its key concern is to provide a trusted, single version of the truth on which to base decisions as to ensure that organizations do not use multiple, potentially inconsistent versions of the same concept in different parts of their operations. The focus is on unifying company-wide reference data types, such as customers and products. Setting up a master data management initiative involves many steps and tools, including data source identification, mapping out the system's architecture, constructing data transformation, cleansing and normalization rules, providing data storage capabilities, monitoring and governance facilities, and so on. Another key element is a centrally governed data model and metadata repository. Perhaps surprisingly, many vendor solutions to set up an MDM initiative look very similar to data integration solutions we discussed before, such as data consolidation, federation, propagation, or virtualization techniques. These integration approaches can be used as a method to achieve maturity in master data management. Note, however, this assumes these solutions are used to set up a trusted, single version of the truth of the data on which decisions are based and that no other representation of the data is used anywhere in the organization. In what follows, we discuss data governance. We first introduce the basic ideas and then elaborate on different frameworks and standards. Due to data quality and integration concerns, organizations are, incre are increasingly implementing company-wide data governance initiatives to govern and oversee these concerns. To manage and safeguard data quality, a data governance culture should be put in place, assigning clear roles and responsibilities. Another important element is the ability to assess data lineage. The ultimate aim of data governance is to set up a company-wide control and supported approach towards data quality, accompanied by data quality management processes. The core idea is to manage data as an asset rather than a liability and adopt a proactive attitude towards data quality problems. To succeed, it should be a key element of a company's corporate governance and supported by senior management. Different frameworks and standards have been introduced for data governance. In what follows, we summarize some notable data governance standards and frameworks. The Total Data Quality Management TDQM framework developed by Wong is illustrated here. It presents a cycle consisting of four steps, define, measure, analyze, and improve, which are performed iteratively. The define step identifies the pertinent data quality dimensions. These can then be quantified using metrics in the measure step. The analyze step tries to identify the root cause of the diagnosed data quality problems. These can then be remedied in the improve step. 
The Capability Maturity Model Integration, CMMI, is a training and appraisal program geared towards the improvement of business processes. It was developed at Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, and is required by many United States Department of and is required by many United States Department of Defense and US government contracts, especially in software development. CMMI defines the maturity of a process by five levels, which are called performed, managed, defined, measured, and optimized. Every level aims at improving the description, predictability, control, and measurement of the process at hand. While CMMI focuses on a process-oriented view, CMU has developed various site standards applying the same concept of maturity levels. The data management maturity model applies the five levels of maturity to the governance of data, its quality, and its supporting infrastructure. Level one, perform. Data is managed as a requirement for implementing a project in a reactive manner with little discipline or emphasis on data quality. The emphasis is on data repair. Level two, managed. There is awareness of the importance of managing data. Data is understood to be a critical infrastructure asset. Some policies are set in place to control quality and monitor data. Level three, defined. Data is treated as a critical asset for successful performance. Data quality is predictable. and Policies are set in place to meet specific needs. Level four, measured. Data is treated as a source of competitive advantage and seen as a strategic asset. Fully managed policies and formal specifications govern the quality of the data. A single source of truth is provided for the data. Level five, optimized. Data is seen as critical to survival in a dynamic market. The organization is continuously improving its data governance initiatives and the quality of its data sources. Inspired by the Project Management Body of Knowledge, PMBOK, a collection of processes, best practices, terminologies, and guidelines for project management overseen by the Project Management Institute, PMI, the Data Management Body of Knowledge, DMBOK, aims to offer a similar collection towards data management. DMBOK is overseen by DALMA International, Data Management Association, and lists best practices towards data quality management metadata management, data warehousing, data integration, and data governance. DMBOK is in its second version. Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies, COVID, is a framework created by the International Professional Association, ISACA, for Information Technology or IT Management and IT Governance. As the name suggests, COBIT describes a series of implementable control sets and organizes them in a logical framework. The core goal of COBIT is to link business goals to IT goals, starting from business requirements and mapping these to IT requirements, and hence provides measurement tools, metrics, and maturity models to measure the effectiveness of these IT goals. Even though many of these focus on aspects such as data quality and integration, COVID itself is a very large and comprehensive, comprehensive framework encompassing much more than just data governance. It is important to mention, however, that COVID will often be positioned as an overall IT governance standard utilized at a high level, under which different standards, frameworks, and practices will be placed and aligned. The Information Technology Infrastructure Library, ITIL, is a set of detailed practices for IT service management that focuses on aligning IT services with the needs and requirements of business. ITIL is published in five volumes, each of which covers a different IT service management lifecycle stage. Just as with COVID, also ITIL encompasses much more governance than just data quality and integration aspects, though puts a heavy emphasis on these elements in its fifth volume. The latter focuses on continuous service improvement, where several best practices are outlined towards benchmarking, monitoring, measuring, and improving the quality of IT services, and hence also that of the underlying data sources. 
Other parts of ITO deal with integration issues and their impact on different IT services. It is remarkable how many vendors and cloud providers are trying to offer ways to handle the data integration issue in a world where companies are either moving their data to the cloud or are shifting to a big data environment. Some examples include Scoop and Flume for Hadoop. Apache Scoop is a tool designed for efficiently transferring data in bulk between Hadoop and traditional structured data stores such as relational databases. Apache Flume is a distributed system for efficiently collecting, aggregating, and moving large amounts of log data from many different sources to a centralized data store. Apache Kylin, an open source and Linux engine designed to provide an SQL interface and multi-dimensional analysis on top of Hadoop supporting extremely large data sets. Think of it as a technology to define star schemes and analyze OLAP cubes on top of data stored in Hadoop. Google Cloud Dataflow and BigQuery ETL. Googling, Google is offering a managed service for developing and executing data processing and integration patterns, including ETL, to bring data in its cl Google Cloud platform. Amazon Redshift, a managed cloud-based data warehouse solution that tries to integrate well with existing business intelligence tools, but can run queries against petabytes of structured data. Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS, a managed web service that makes it easier to set up, operate, and automatically scale a relational database in the cloud without having to set up such a database yourself. In this chapter, we have discussed some technical managerial aspects of data and databases, namely data integration, data quality, master data management, and data governance. Some had also a technical element, in particular, the different data integration technologies and the complementary techniques to efficiently search unstructured data in a company-wide or worldwide web setting. We have seen how these aspects play an important role as companies start using a multitude of databases and information systems over time, especially when the need arises to consolidate a company's data to provide one unified view, for instance, to construct a data warehouse to provide business intelligence solutions. If you want more information about this, I'm happy to refer you to our book, Principles of Database Management, and um, the website at the bottom of my slide.